how does an electric capacitor really work? In the comments under one of my recent videos, many viewers asked for a video on this topic. And initially, these requests left me puzzled, as I always thought that the principles of operation of a capacitor, being one of the most common electronic components, should be quite well known. However, after watching several other videos on this topic, I seem to have understood the problem. Unfortunately, many popularizers often explain the operation of capacitors not exactly incorrectly, but rather strangely, sometimes so strangely that such explanations are more confusing than truly explanatory and can lead listeners to have incorrect ideas about what is actually happening. And it is these incorrect ideas that explain many seemingly strange questions regarding the principles of how capacitors work. Questions about where their charge is actually stored or whether they conduct alternating current. In general, yes, there is something to talk about here. And that's what we'll focus on today. First, we'll delve into how capacitors work from a theoretical standpoint. Then, we'll familiarize ourselves with how these principles are implemented in the most common types of capacitors. And finally, we'll briefly examine why capacitors are used. Namely, try to understand why these components are so widespread that they can be found in almost any circuit. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and let's get started. All capacitors are essentially constructed the same way. They consist of two metal plates placed a small distance apart with a layer of material between them that cannot conduct electric current a dielectric insulator. Much of the confusion surrounding capacitors is related to this dielectric layer because its role and function are often explained not quite correctly or even completely incorrectly. It even goes so far that the dielectric layer is referred to as a secondary component. Supposedly, its primary purpose is to prevent the capacitor plates from touching each other or to prevent electrical breakdown of the capacitor at high voltages. In reality, the dielectric layer is a key element of the capacitor, playing a defining role in its operation. However, to understand what it actually does, we first need to understand what happens on the capacitor plates when it's connected in the simplest electrical circuit, consisting of the capacitor itself, a DC voltage source, and a switch capable of closing and opening the circuit. Let's close the circuit and see what happens in it. The electric field created by the power source will act on the electrons in the conductor and the metal plates. Here, I use arrows to indicate the direction of the force exerted by this field, which pushes negatively charged electrons. So the field itself will be directed in the opposite direction, from positive to negative. Under the influence of this field, electrons will be pushed towards one of the plates, where their concentration will increase, and pulled away from the other where it will decrease. It's important to remember that initially, both plates had zero electric charge because the total negative charge of the electrons in them was equal to the total positive charge of the protons in the nuclei of the ions in the crystal lattice. However, when we remove some electrons from one plate, the total charge of the ions will exceed the total charge of the electrons and the plate will acquire a positive charge. In the other plate, where electrons will increase, the charge will become negative. Of course, a positively charged plate will attract electrons, just as a negatively charged plate will repel them. So, it will be much more difficult for the electric field to pull each subsequent electron from one plate and push it into the other. Moreover, these forces will be so great that if we were to individually apply the field to each plate, we would simply be unable to create a noticeable electric charge on them. However, this process is significantly facilitated by the fact that closely spaced plates, as they acquire charge, begin to influence each other. A positively charged plate will attract electrons in the negatively charged one, whereas the negatively charged plate will create an additional repulsive force acting on the remaining electrons in the positively charged plate. Again, I remind you that with arrows, I show the direction of the force acting on the electrons, the electric field, thanks to which this force appears, has the opposite direction. As the charge on the plates increases, this force will also increase. However, the opposing forces that prevent further charging of the plates, acting on the electrons within the plates themselves, will increase more rapidly. 
At a certain stage, the sum of the forces acting on the electrons in both plates will become zero. The process of electron movement between the plates will stop. We say that the capacitor is fully charged. It's not difficult to understand that the amount of charge a capacitor can store depends on the voltage of the source used to charge it. The higher the voltage, the more charge we can move. The proportionality constant that determines how much charge we can accumulate on the plates of a given capacitor at a given voltage is called the capacitance of the capacitor. Clearly, the capacitance of the capacitor will be directly proportional to the area of the plates and inversely proportional to the distance between them. Indeed, the larger the plates, the lower the concentration of additional electrons will be, meaning the greater the average distance between them and therefore the weaker the repulsive force that impedes the transfer of new additional electrons to the plates and vice versa. Furthermore, the capacitance of the capacitor will be inversely proportional to the distance between the plates, which is also quite logical. The closer the plates are to each other, the more they will influence each other's electrons and the more effectively they will contribute to charging the capacitor. If the insulator separating the conductors is some magical substance that does not possess electrical properties, then the proportionality constant will be the so-called electric constant, the same one that appears in Coulomb's law, equal to 8.85 times 10 with minus 12 farads per meter. From this, we conclude that there are two ways to increase the capacitance of a capacitor, increase the area of the plates or decrease the distance between them. Let's open the circuit, disconnect the battery, connect the ends of the circuit together, and then close the circuit again. Obviously, the electric fields in the system will strive to equalize the electron concentration in the plates, meaning electron flow between them will begin in the opposite direction, from the plate with more electrons to the one with fewer. The only way for electrons to move as dictated by the field is through the conductor connecting the capacitor plates. Therefore, we will see that an electric current flows through this conductor. In other words, after disconnecting the power source, the charged capacitor itself becomes a power source for the circuit. Until, of course, the charges on its plates, or its electrodes, as they are also called, equalize. As we have seen, in a circuit containing a DC voltage source and a capacitor, no current flows at all. The energy of the power source is spent only on charging the capacitor, and when it reaches its maximum charge level at a given voltage according to its capacitance, the movement of charges in the circuit stops. However, if we power the circuit with a variable voltage source, to our surprise, current will flow in such a circuit. And not understanding how the capacitor works exactly, we might conclude that the capacitor somehow magically conducts alternating current. In reality, this is not the case at all. In fact, no current flows through the capacitor neither direct nor alternating. Just in the first half cycle, when the field created by the power source is directed, let's say, to the right, positive charge will accumulate on the right plate and negative charge on the left. In the next half cycle, when the direction of the field changes, charges will start flowing from the left plate to the right plate. Thus, the capacitor will be recharged in the opposite way. This process will repeat every half cycle electrons will again start flowing from the right plate to the left, and so on. In other words, the current in the circuit, if we have correctly selected the capacitor parameters, will flow constantly. And if we connect, for example, a light bulb to such a circuit, it will light up. However, no current will flow through the capacitor itself, neither direct nor alternating. It is worth noting that due to the small value of the electric constant, Achieving a substantial amount of charge stored in such a capacitor will not be easy. Fortunately, the capacitance of the capacitor can be significantly increased by choosing the right material for our insulating spacer. Above, we haven't discussed how this spacer reacts to the electric field that arises between the capacitor plates, assuming it to be entirely electrically indifferent, as if the dielectric material were completely devoid of electric charges. In real dielectrics, of course, this is not the case. All substances are composed of molecules, molecules of atoms, and atoms of positively charged nuclei and negatively charged electrons. 
Unlike metals, these charge carriers in a dielectric are in a bound state, meaning they cannot move freely, which is what makes a dielectric a dielectric. However, they are present and they will respond to the influence of an external electric field, albeit differently than in a conductor. For example, in the molecules of many substances, charge carriers are unevenly distributed within the molecule. One part of the molecule may have an excess negative charge, while another part may have an excess positive charge. These charges cancel each other out and are opposite in sign, meaning the overall charge of the molecule is zero. However, these differently charged parts of the molecule will still create an electric field. Of course, in a real substance, all these molecules are oriented randomly, and the overall electric field of all the molecules will be zero. However, if we place the substance in an external electric field, such as the field between the charged plates of a capacitor, it will cause the molecules to orient along the field. The negatives will align towards the positively charged plate and the positives towards the negatively charged plate. Now, the dielectric as a whole will start to act like a source of an electric field, as if one side has accumulated a negative charge and the other a positive charge. This induced electric field resulting from placing the dielectric in the field between the capacitor plates, in turn, will also influence these plates. The positive charge on one side of the dielectric will attract electrons from the corresponding plate, and the negative charge on the other side will repel electrons from the opposite plate. In effect, the field will aid in the accumulation of charge on the plates meaning that with the presence of a dielectric, we can charge our capacitor to the same voltage much more strongly. Indeed, with the presence of a dielectric between the plates, the formula for capacitance is written as follows, where epsilon is the so-called dielectric permittivity of the dielectric. This constant varies for different substances and can range from units to tens, hundreds, or thousands, and in some cases, even hundreds of thousands and millions of farads per meter. It can be said that dielectric polarization affects the charging of the capacitor much more significantly than the electrical interaction between electrons in the plates. In other words, if we attempt to charge two capacitors of the same size with the same voltage, one using an ideal dielectric with a relative permittivity of one, or, for example, a capacitor filled with air whose relative permittivity is close to one, and the other with a dielectric spacer, we would observe that the charge stored in the empty capacitor is very small compared to the charge in the second capacitor with the dielectric spacer. You can even conduct an experiment. Take a capacitor, charge it, and then remove the dielectric spacer. It turns out that after removing the dielectric, the capacitor will be practically uncharged. From these experiments, one might be tempted to conclude that the charge in a capacitor is actually stored in the dielectric. However, considering what we already know about capacitor physics, it's clear that this conclusion would be incorrect. In reality, the charge is stored in the plates themselves, and there is no charge in the dielectric because we did not introduce or remove charge carriers there. Thus, the charge of the dielectric remains zero. Any movement of charge occurs only within the plates of the capacitor, and accordingly, the charge is stored in these plates. The dielectric, when placed inside the capacitor, acquires polarization, not charge, and this polarization leads to the creation of an electric field, which in turn affects the capacitance of the capacitor. For example, in our second thought experiment, after removing the dielectric, the capacitance of the capacitor will decrease significantly by tens, hundreds, or even thousands of times, meaning that it will be charged much more strongly than it could have been without the dielectric the plates will simply be unable to retain the accumulated charge, and it will leak off from them. Perhaps electrons will directly transfer from the negatively charged plate, where they are in excess, to the positively charged plate through the resulting empty space. This explains the observed phenomenon. The charge was indeed in the capacitor plates, but after removing the dielectric, they could no longer retain it and the capacitor charge decreased significantly to negligibly small levels compared to the initial value. Thus, it may seem to us that the charge disappeared along with the dielectric. But in fact, this did happen not because the charge was contained in the dielectric, 
but because the dielectric created conditions allowing the plates to accumulate charge. By the way, charge leakage between the plates of a capacitor can sometimes occur even if a dielectric is present between the plates. Ultimately, the bonds holding charge carriers in the dielectric in place have limited strength. Under significant voltages, or rather significant electric field intensities, these fields can sometimes break such bonds, releasing charge carriers, and the dielectric will gradually begin to conduct electric current. Consequently, charges will flow directly between the plates through the dielectric. This is called capacitor breakdown and often occurs when the allowable voltage is exceeded. In the best case, during breakdown, the capacitor will no longer be able to retain charge, meaning it will cease to function properly. In the worst case, more severe consequences are possible. The flowing current can heat the dielectric significantly, and the capacitor may burn out or even explode. Some capacitors are prone to exploding due to other operational violations, and the reasons for this will become clear when we understand how capacitors are structured, which we will delve into right now. The simplest and one of the most common types of capacitors are ceramic capacitors. They are most similar to what we have been discussing all this time. Essentially, they consist of two metal electrode plates, usually made of copper or aluminum, between which a solid dielectric is placed. Today, calcium or barium titanates are often used in this capacity, with the dielectric constant of the latter reaching up to 10,000 farads per meter, meaning such a capacitor can have a capacitance 10,000 times greater than the same structure without a dielectric inside. Sometimes, ceramic capacitors are made multi-layered. They have several plates stacked with layers of dielectric, parallelly connected to a common contact. The total charge of such a capacitor equals the sum of the charges of each layer. And because the distance between the plates of each layer is small, the capacitance additionally increases. However, the closer the plates are, the lower the breakdown voltage, and multi-layer capacitors are not suitable for use in high-voltage circuits. Overall, ceramic capacitors are distinguished by simplicity, reliability, and cost-effectiveness, although they do not have very high capacitance. Usually, it is less than that of comparable capacitors of another design, so-called electrolytic capacitors. Disassembling an electrolytic capacitor, we won't see anything inside that looks like the structure we've been talking about. Instead of electrode plates and dielectric spacers, we'll see something like a rolled up strip, often with some unknown liquid protruding under pressure. Unrolling the strip inside, you will most often find two thin sheets of aluminum foil, usually attached to two sheets of paper or similar material, to which, in turn, the contacts of our capacitor are attached. Between them, another sheet of paper or fabric is usually placed. It's needed to hold the same liquid we saw. One of the aluminum sheets will appear somewhat rough. This will be our anode, meaning this is where the positive charge will accumulate. The anode aluminum is covered with a relatively thin film of aluminum oxide, acting as a dielectric. The roughness of the anode is artificially created to increase the surface area of the anode, which, as we know, will mean an increase in the capacitance of the capacitor. The liquid we see is an electrolyte, which conducts electric current well. Specifically, it is the electrolyte uniformly filling the cracks and grooves on the surface of the aluminum oxide on the anode that will play the role of the cathode, i.e. the second plate of our capacitor. Thus, we obtain a sufficiently large surface area of the plate and a sufficiently small distance between the cathode and the anode ensuring the capacitor has a larger capacitance for the same size. However, electrolytic capacitors have several serious drawbacks. Among other things, they are polarized, which means they can only be connected to a circuit in a certain way, plus to plus, minus to minus, and never the other way around. The issue is that if such a capacitor is connected with reverse polarity, electrochemical processes in the electrolyte will lead to the dissolution of the oxide layer and direct contact between the aluminum of the anode and the electrolyte. This will cause the capacitor to break down and current will flow directly between the cathode and the anode. When current flows, all substances heat up and the electrolyte is no exception. If the voltage is high enough, the electrolyte can even boil. The vapor produced will accumulate inside the capacitor's case, increasing its pressure. 
and the capacitor might even explode. I strongly advise against experimenting with capacitors for the sake of amusement. An explosion can be quite powerful, and the flying debris from a ruptured capacitor can cause serious injury to you or those around you. In short, yes, you understand. Don't try this at home. Additionally, the oxide layer can degrade over time. The electrolyte can leak out, dry up, and so on. In general, electrolytic capacitors are more finicky and prone to failure, whereas ceramic capacitors, by and large, don't have such issues. Ceramic and electrolytic capacitors are the most common types of these devices, but this is far from their only use. There are also polymer, film, and tantalum-based capacitors, and there are also supercapacitors, or ionisters, which use carbon electrodes. Sometimes, air capacitors are still encountered, where ordinary air serves as the dielectric. Such devices are most often used when variable capacitors are needed. As their capacitance can be easily adjusted on the fly, by altering the distance between the plates. I won't delve deeply into discussing the differences between various types of capacitors, their advantages and disadvantages here. These are questions more related to circuitry and electronics rather than physics. And I'm more of a theorist. I've held a soldering iron in my hands probably no more than a dozen times. And in the vast majority of cases, it didn't end well. More about circuitry lies in how capacitors are used. Nevertheless, I think I should still say a few words about it. For example, capacitors are often used to stabilize the power supply of various electronic devices sensitive to voltage fluctuations. To do this, a capacitor is connected in parallel to the powered device. After the power is turned on, the capacitor charges according to the voltage in the network. If the power supply voltage exceeds the norm, the capacitor charges additionally, absorbing the excess current. If the voltage drops below the set level and, consequently, below the voltage to which the capacitor is charged, it then discharges the stored charge to provide additional power to the network, making voltage spikes in both directions less noticeable. This same capacitor property allows it to be used in rectifier circuits designed to convert alternating current similar to what we have in our wall sockets into direct current needed to power virtually all electronic devices. The capacitor is connected in parallel to the rectifier output with a diode placed before it whose main property is to allow current flow only in one direction. That is, if alternating current, which varies in magnitude from minus U to plus U, is supplied to the circuit, the diode will only allow the voltage from zero to plus U to pass through. And then the capacitor smooths out this curve essentially the same way we saw earlier charging when the voltage is high and delivering the accumulated charge back into the circuit when it drops below a certain value. As a result, the output of the circuit receives a voltage much closer to direct current. The reverse task, converting direct current to alternating current, is also solved using capacitors in combination with inductive coils. And of course, capacitors are the key element of the memory cells in modern computer DRAM. More details on how this works were discussed in one of our previous videos. In general, capacitors are the second most common element in electrical and electronic circuits. And I hope that thanks to this video, you will be able to form an understanding of why and how these important devices fulfill the tasks set before them from a physical point of view. In our next videos, we will definitely talk more about the physical principles of operation and other basic electrical components. But for now, farewell, and until we meet again.